Oh Lord, that is our prayer, that you would speak. You have spoken in your word and your word, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, speaks still. We pray to be hearers, and not just hearers, but doers. We long to know you, O oh God, and you have graciously given us your word that we might. And we pray to hear with eager ears this morning, with soft hearts. May you do your work in us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. want to uh, give all of us as a body of believers an opportunity to weep with those who weep this morning. Um, Jim Dedich's father passed away yesterday, suddenly, about two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, his name is Jim as well. And so we just encourage you to uh, pray for the Dedich family, for Jim and Marcella, for their kids, uh, for Jim's mom, Cecilia. Uh, as a family enduring significant sadness and shock, and we would just encourage you to pray for them this week and uh, know that you will demonstrate uh, love and care and kindness to them, and we'll try to make you aware of needs as, as we're aware. Uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer for the Dedich family now together. Oh God, we live and breathe in a world uh, marked by death, universal reality, and so unwelcome when it comes. You have called death that great enemy, the last enemy. And we feel its sting, we feel the pain of loss. And we just pray now for Jim Dedich, for Marcella, for Jim's mom, Cecilia, uh, for their precious kids. We pray that you would be the God of all comfort, the God of all peace, that you would give your kindness. Uh, you are the great shepherd. Would you lead them to green pastures and still waters as they walk through a very dark valley? May they not fear because you are with them. God, we pray that they would know in greater measure the depths of your love and kindness and the goodness of your purpose. Would you bring comfort that the world does not have access to peace that the world cannot know and through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that our friends would feel your love, would feel your comfort and pray that you would give us wisdom in how to care for them well. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8 this morning. We're going to continue our study of this fantastic chapter in this wonderful book. And we'll be looking at Romans 8, 5 to 8. And in one sense, this is a continuation of what we looked at last week. Last week, we looked at life in the spirit. And this morning, we'll be looking at life in the flesh. I love before and after pictures, a record of what things were like before they are like they are now. And you can see these on news sites after a natural disaster, a hurricane or a tsunami comes through, and you may have seen the sort of swipe version of the before and after. You, you can take the little bar and, and move it from one side to the other, and, and one half of the picture shows what this looked like before the hurricane came through, and as you swipe the bar over, you, you're in the same picture, the same perspective, but you see the results of the disaster. It's an effective tool for seeing a before and an after. Of course, the, the gurus of fitness uh, use these tools. You, you are encouraged to take a before picture before you start the weight loss program or the fitness program or the workout program, and an after picture. Of course, in the after picture, you're tightening things up. and Maybe you've taken before and after pictures of a home remodel project or a landscape project, 
It's really fun to go back and see what did it look like before. For the Christian, Romans 8 describes the new normal. And we can forget the old normal. Romans 8, 5 to 8 is a reminder of the old normal. What was it like when you were not under the reign of grace, when you were in fact under the reign of sin, when you were under the tyranny of death and under the law? If this contrast in Romans 8, 5 to 8 is helpful, lest we forget who we were and what life was like in our BC days before Christ days. This passage is also helpful in terms of self-examination. You may be one who is in need of having God help you see where you stand before him. Are you really in Christ or are you not? You must know that it's possible to live under the trappings of Christianity, Christian culture, Christian things, Christian activities, and still have no eternal interest in Christ himself. It's possible to go to church and not be born again. If that's you this morning, I, I think that there is probably no better passage than Romans 8 to help make a determination as you examine your own heart. Am I in Christ or am I not? Romans 8 gives us a before and after picture of the Holy Spirit's entrance into a person's life at conversion. Last week, we began to look at the after. What does life in the Spirit look like? And this morning, we'll follow the Apostle Paul's description of the Spirit's work in the life of a believer by examining the contrast. What was life like before the Spirit came into my life? Well, let's read together, and we'll pick it up again in verse 1, Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, nor is it even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The Christian is defined in verse 4 as the one who does not walk according to the flesh. In other words, the Christian is the one who walks according to the Spirit. The non-Christian is described this way, one who walks according to the flesh. And in this passage, these two categories, in the flesh and in the spirit, describe two types of people. They're not describing two types of Christians, a fleshy Christian and a spiritual Christian. They're not describing your Christian life on Tuesday as compared to your Christian life on Monday. On Tuesday, I was really more fleshly. On Monday, I was more in the spirit. No, these are contrasting two different people, two different kinds of people, one under the reign of grace and the other under the reign of sin, one who is in Christ and one who is not in Christ. And there are only those two categories. There is no neutral ground between them. There is no mediating territory. You are either in the flesh or in the spirit. There is only the natural man and the man born again. The non-Christian life, life in the flesh, is what is described in our text this morning. Romans 8, 5 to 8 is bracketed by verse 5 and verse 8. 
Notice verse 5, those who are according to the flesh. And verse 8, those who are in the flesh. Those two descriptions, nearly synonymous, bracket this whole description of life outside of Christ. And this is one of the clearest, most tragic descriptions of man in his lost state. The picture painted here of man outside of the gospel is dark and it is dire. And we're looking this morning at the non-Christian life, life in the flesh, and it is characterized by five realities that are described here in Romans 8, 5 to 8. The first reality that describes, characterizes the non-Christian life is an uninterrupted natural disposition. An uninterrupted natural disposition. A disposition is just a person's inherent qualities of mind and character. It's who you are on the inside, uh, what you are like. And notice in verse 5, the description is according to. They are according to the flesh. That is, uh, in keeping with a standard. And they are doing what according to the flesh? Verse 5 just simply says, they are according to the flesh. That is, they are being. They are existing. They simply live out an existence according to the standard of the flesh. What is flesh? This is a very flexible word in your Bible. It is not inherently a bad word. Sometimes the word flesh just means physical body. And, and as such, it's not inherently sinful. The New Testament does not depict uh, the, the difference between the immaterial and material man as a difference between what is good and what is evil, right? The Epicureans, some of the ancient philosophers said that anything tangible is evil and anything intangible is good. And those philosophers went one of two ways with that. They said, hey, since my flesh is evil, just do whatever things you want to do in the flesh um, and it's fine because your spirit's good, don't worry about it. And then some went the other way and said, since the flesh is evil, anything physical is therefore evil, so avoid all of it that you can. And both of those are wrong. God created the human body very good. It is not intrinsically all by itself evil. Now, our physical bodies happen to be the vehicle through which the evil in us makes its way out. But oftentimes, this word flesh just simply means a physical body. John 1.14 is a good example. The word became flesh. Right? As God the Son, Jesus, the sinless one, took on physical form, a, a human body, a real, literal, physical body. But the use of the word flesh, particularly by Paul, in context dealing with the doctrine of sin... Flesh tends to refer to the whole man. Not merely outward physical activities, but activities which involve the inner person, the mind, the intellect, the emotions, and the will of man. And particularly, it refers in those contexts to unredeemed human fallenness. Unredeemed human fallenness. We get a picture of this in Galatians 5.19. Paul says there, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, and he goes on to describe a list. I want you to listen to this list described in Galatians 5 and understand that the deeds of the flesh are not merely tangible, physical, bodily things, but they are inner man kind of things. They involve the intellect, the emotions, the will. The deeds of the flesh are evident, Paul says, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There we get a, a short list, and it is a short list of the kinds of things that are the deeds of the flesh. What does the flesh do? Not merely physical things, but 
willing things, thinking things, feeling things. Flesh is that unredeemed fallenness that courses through every part of man, every capacity of man, beginning in the heart, the inner man, which is the seed of his thinking and feeling and doing, and working outward from the heart to visible activity. And in this context in Romans 8, flesh is set against the Holy Spirit. He is mentioned some 20 times in this chapter. To be according to the flesh, that is to exist in a realm according to the standard of the flesh, and to be in the flesh, verse 8, is to be or exist without the Holy Spirit. It is to be without the Holy Spirit. It is the categorical statement of one still under the reign of sin, one not yet under the reign of grace. One has said, flesh then is the whole nature of man turned away from God in the supreme interest of self devoted to the creature. And for the unbeliever, flesh is all there is. For the believer, there is residual depravity. Flesh is still in the equation, in the equation. flesh is still present. In fact, Galatians 5 will go on to tell us that the flesh wars against the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. The flesh for the believer is the yet unredeemed part of our humanity. And as we walk through Romans 8, we're going to discover that war, and Romans 8 is going to give us some instruction about that war. Flesh is what man is by nature. It is... Natural. It's natural. It's what comes natural to man in his own abilities and his own constitution. And often, because flesh living is natural, it doesn't feel wrong or strange. Any more than a fish doesn't feel wet. A fish is surrounded by water all the time. It doesn't know the categories of wet and dry. All it is is wet all the time. People ask me about my December birthday, and they'll say, what is it like to have a birthday so close to Christmas? I don't know. I've never had any other birthday. I don't know what it's like not to, so it's hard for me to describe what it's like to. People, I'll, I'll leave my kids out of this one. No, I won't. Sorry, buddy. People ask Emmett all the time, what's it like to live with four sisters? I don't know. <laughs> He's never had it any other way. The natural man has never had it any other way than what is natural. What they do, those ones existing in the standard of the flesh, notice verse 5, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. What else would we expect from people who live and exist according to the standard of flesh? They're going to think about the things of the flesh, dwell on the things of the flesh, to care for the things of the flesh, to aspire after the things of the flesh, to exhibit an active, continual pattern of unbroken thought related to fleshly things. This is the fundamental bent of an unbeliever. It's natural. Those in the realm of flesh have simply never experienced spiritual renewal, spiritual overhaul, rejuvenation, regeneration. They're only capable of what is natural to fallen humanity. They are not capable of what the Holy Spirit produces in a new creature. Their nature, what they are like, is determined simply by the flesh. One commentator said this about religion in the flesh. Whatever may be their profession of religion, their hearts are supremely engrossed with earthly things. And for these... If they could obtain their wish through eternity, they would gladly barter all the glories of heaven. You see, the fleshly mind, even when it's trying to do spiritual things, can only think fleshy thoughts, 
can only long for fleshy things, natural things. Listen to Jesus' assessment of our condition in Mark 7. He says, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed out of the man from within and defile the man. Man's fundamental problem is his fundamental nature, what he is like. Thomas Boston, commenting on Jesus' words in Mark 7 on the nature of man, says this, and I'm going to quote him at length here. The heart that was made according to God's own heart is now the reverse of it, a forge of evil imaginations, a sink of inordinate affections, and a storehouse of all impiety. Behold the heart of natural man. The mind is defiled. The thoughts of the heart are evil. The will and the affections are defiled. From the first day to the last day, in this state, they are in midnight darkness. There is not the glimmering of the light of holiness in them. Not one holy thought can ever be produced by an unholy heart. Oh, what a vile heart is this. Oh, what a corrupt nature is this. The tree that always brings forth fruit but never good fruit. Whatever soil it be set in, whatever pains be taken with it, must naturally be an evil tree. And what can that heart be whereof every imagination, every set of thoughts is only evil and that continually? Surely that corruption is ingrained in our hearts, interwoven with our very natures, has sunk into the marrow of our souls and will never be cured but by a miracle of grace. Now such is man's heart, such is his nature, till regenerating grace change it. That is the state of natural man. This is what we are like by birth. Life according to the flesh is a life of uninterrupted natural disposition. John Murray said, human nature is corrupted, directed, and controlled by sin. That is, it's simply a life not governed by the Holy Spirit. And you who are in Christ now, who, who look back on a transformation that only God could bring about, you need no convincing of this truth. You freely admit, I'm the problem. I'm the perpetrator. I'm guilty. I had problems at my core that I could not solve. I was helpless and hopeless and dead. And Jesus Christ saved me. And the Holy Spirit has begun a work in me that I couldn't bring about. You know this. You need no convincing of this. And yet you try to convince a spiritually dead person that he is spiritually dead. And you will be confronted with every argument. Every protest. No, look what I can do. Look what I'm capable of. God's assessment. The one that truly matters, the, the only one that's right, <laughs> is that man is corrupt in his very nature. Governed by a life of uninterrupted natural disposition. Secondly, according to Romans 8, life in the flesh is death. I know in sermonic outlines, you're supposed to have the same number of words in point two as you have in point one. The text here is so arresting. Look what Paul says. For the mind set on the flesh is death. Verse 6. He doesn't say the mind set on the flesh is kind of like death or, or it leads to death or it culminates and terminates in death. It just simply is death. This is what Paul began this section with in Romans 5, 20. 
as sin reigned in death. Life under the dominion of sin is, is a dominion of death. The words mind set in verse 6, for the mind set on the flesh, uh, really it's just a noun, the mindset, and, and it comes from the verb back in verse 5, those who are according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, there's the verb, but you've been setting your minds on the flesh, now that mindset shows up in verse 6, and the mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset here is this continual pattern of unbroken natural thinking. It's your outlook on life, your assumptions, your values, desires, your purposes. The mindset of the flesh is your orientation, a way of thinking. It includes the, the palette of your feelings, and it includes the direction of your will. How you think, the desires you have, and what you decide to do. All of this is the mindset of the flesh, and it is... Death, according to Paul. Charles Hodge says this, It's not that the seeking of fleshly things leads to death, but the fleshy state of mind which reveals itself in the pursuit of fleshly objects is death. And by death is, of course, meant spiritual death, the absence and opposite of spiritual life. It includes alienation from God, unholiness, and misery. Why, verse 5, do the ones existing according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh? Because, verse 7, the mindset of the flesh is death. In other words, death characterizes life in the flesh. There is no life principle to produce anything other than that which is characterized as death. There's nothing supernatural to counteract that which is natural or fleshly. This is an unmixed condition characterized by death, in the realm of death. And all are spiritually dead until they're in Christ. Ephesians 2 makes that clear. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. The, the works of unbelievers are dead. Listen to Hebrews 9, 14. The blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanses your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. They're the, the things that spiritually dead people do are called dead things. Of course, their faith is dead. James 2 describes a dead faith because it has no fruit, no works. Churchgoers can be dead, 1 Timothy 5, 6. There are people who give themselves to wanton pleasure, dead even while they live. I'm talking about people in the church. Whole churches can be described as dead. Revelation 3, 1 to the church at Sardis. I know your deeds. You have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. And of course, the gospel is to be preached to the dead. 1 Peter 4, 6, the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead. <laughs> Unbelievers do not possess life. 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Unbelievers will be judged as the dead. Even though very much in existence and conscious resurrected with new bodies to live forever. They are called the dead. They will give an account, 1 Peter 4, 5, to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Of course, the Apostle John in Revelation 20 saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened and they were judged, all of the dead, according to their deeds. Physical death is the culmination of this spiritual death that dominates this living according to the flesh. And the contrast in verse 6 is life in the spirit. Notice the second half of verse 6. We looked at this last week. Life in the spirit is life. Existence in the flesh, existence according to the flesh is death. There's a third characteristic of life in the flesh here. 
It's in the first part of verse 7. It is hostility to God. Hostility to God. Notice the because at the beginning of verse 7. The mindset on the flesh is death because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. Why is the mindset of the flesh on death? Because it's bent against God. And God is the God of life. He's the giver of life. He's the source of all life. He's the sustainer of all life. He is the one who preserves life. What did Jesus say when he came to the earth? I am the way and the truth and the life. It was given to the Son to have life in himself, and the Son gives life to whom he wishes. The mindset of the flesh is death because it is opposed to the source of life. It is opposed to the very one who has life and gives life. If the God who is life, who promises life, who gives eternal life to all who ask, if that one is rejected, if that one is excluded, then death is the result. Life lived apart from the spirit of life is spiritual death. And so unbelievers are at enmity with God because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. This is God's assessment of the human condition, hostility towards Him. Unbelievers are at enmity with God. They they live in hatred of God. There is no peace with God. They are at war with God. One has said, it is the essence of sin to be against God. And this hostility toward God is not the result of some calculated thought. You wake up one day and you say, oh, you know what? I think I need an enemy. I'll pick God. No, it is perfectly natural. Hostility toward God is the mindset of the flesh. And many people hate God who actually claim to love God. Have you noticed this? Lots of people talk about God. Lots of people thank God at awards ceremonies. Lots of people tweet about God. Lots of people have God conversation and God acknowledgement. Many claim to love God, to serve God, to be loyal to God. And this can be confusing for us sometimes. The Bible has a category for everybody who's not in Christ actually hates God, and yet we live in a world that's filled with people who say, hey, I love God. I don't have anything against Him. I want to trace this hostility towards God. We're confronted with this question, what do you mean He hates God? He's telling me He loves God, and, and look how devoted His life is. Let's think through this hostility towards God and the, and the ways that it's evident in life in the flesh. One way that hostility toward God is evident is simply love of the world. Love of the world. 1 John 2, 15 and 16, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And James gets a little more pointed. James 4.4, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There it is. Everyone who loves this present age, this sinful, Satan-run world that is opposed to God and His ways, the system around us. A love of the world is defined as hostility towards God. And that's true for anything that we would choose to love, set our affections on, something that God hates. To love what God hates and to hate what God loves, that's natural to us humans. The hostility towards God is evidence of our natural condition. Another evidence of our hatred toward God or hostility toward God naturally is that we are under the standard of 
and in league with the God of this world, Satan. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 tells us that in our spiritual deadness, when we were outside of Christ, we used to walk according to him. That is to Satan, the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. And we lived and breathed and did things and you went to the mailbox and you went to work and you married and you had kids and you did all of these things under the dominion of sin in league with God's enemy, Satan. Another aspect of enmity towards God is the way natural man misconstrues God. Rather than worship and serve the God of the Bible, the one true and living God, other than stay in keeping with how God has revealed himself in his word, natural man reinvents God to invent a wrong conception of God, and then to worship the God of our own imaginations. You see, the God of the Bible is not the God that is loved so often when people say, hey, I love God. Oh, you love the God of the Bible? Oh, my God would never do the things the, the God in the Bible does. Well, who is your God? Because there's only one. And any God that we construe and, and make up in our own imagination is not the one true and living God. And how can such an invention be considered by God as anything other than hatred of Him? I don't like the way He's revealed Himself. I will refashion Him. This is enmity to God. The God of the Bible is not the God that is loved. Natural man would remake God if they could, vote him out of office if they had the opportunity, and kill him when they had the chance. Is this saying too much? <laughs> Consider the history of the world and the idolatry that exists in every place. Men exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles all over the face of the earth. Scott Demarest and I have walked together through an idol factory in the 21st century. A, a place where men are employed to, to take wood and metals and hammer them out and, and, and chisel them into gods that are to be worshipped. They're made by men's hands, totally dependent on their maker, and sold in the marketplace. You can actually exchange money for a piece of metal and call this thing your God, and placate this thing, and worship this thing, and ask this thing to intervene on your behalf. It is deaf, mute, dumb, inanimate. It cannot do, and yet it is worshipped because men will not have the true God. How can this be seen as anything other than hatred and enmity towards the one true God? And you walk into a world of idol factories every single day. They might not be selling a piece of metal in the marketplace, a, a carved trinket. But our world worships the things that it goes after. The world worships esteem, applause, wealth, perversion, anything, anything other than the one true God. And I know some of those idols look prettier to us than others. A man who walks into a synagogue and just shoots people at random. is a hater of God who worships an ugly idolatry. But a fine, upstanding citizen who has rejected the one true God and exchanged God's righteousness for his own phony righteousness is a whitewashed, prettied up, dressed up worshiper of idols nonetheless. Consider not just the idolatry in the world, but let's just pick one sin 
We could put any sin in this category and say, there's enmity with God, any sin. But let's just analyze complaint, complaining, discontent, ingratitude. Complaint is a vote of no confidence in God's operation of the universe. Do you understand why Christians stand out in a dark world when they don't complain? If you don't uh, get the picture of that contrast, you need to go back and listen to Josh Kelso's sermon on this topic. When Christians don't complain because they're different, they stand out. Why? Because the whole world complains about everything all the time. It's natural to us to complain. We don't like things the way that they are. Well, who's on the hook for that? Ultimately, God. Listen, man is eager to take credit for what is good in the world and eager to blame God for the world's dysfunction. It's what we do naturally. That long list of sins that provoke God in Romans 1 includes they did not give thanks. Listen, our world around us every day, totally dependent on God's kindness and His mercy for their very existence and for every good thing they experience. And they don't give thanks to the one true God. And that ingratitude, that thankless existence itself is enmity with God. And then the verbal complaining is another step. Not only am I not thankful for the good things God has given, not only do I not acknowledge Him, I've actually taken credit for them. And when things go wrong, God gets the blame. I complain. Should I change? Go to that? Okay. Considered the idolatry all over the world in every age. Any sin as enmity with God, complaint as an example. And murder. I said earlier that natural man would remake God if he could, vote him out of office if he could, kill him when he has the chance. Jesus told this parable in Matthew 21 about a vineyard owner who sent all of his messengers to the workers in the vineyard and said, hey, shape up, guys. And they mistreated all of them. And then he sent his son, whom he loved. Maybe they'll listen to the son. Verse 37 in Matthew 21, Jesus tells the story this way. Afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son, verse 38. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize the inheritance. The, they sought to kill him many times, tried to throw him off a cliff, tried to set him up. Any excuse they could to execute him, their plan eventually succeeded in the greatest crime humanity has ever known, the murder of God, the murder of God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. This is deicide. I'm going to put my maker up on a cross. That's what's in the heart of man. If you think, oh, even in my natural state, I, I would never kill God. I think we would. Watch what happens when natural man's territory gets encroached by God's demands. God puts a demand on a life. Nope, I don't want that. I'll do anything to get away from it. God himself is present on the earth. Light has come into the world. He's the life Listen, the, the men responsible for putting the Romans up and inciting the mob to crucify Christ, some of them were the very men who watched Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They knew who he was. They could not deny his power. They had seen him stronger than death. 
but that was a threat to their temporary little earthly kingdom. And they were willing to give up eternity to have their little way. They murdered the Son of God. Of course, this was God's plan all along. Peter says this in Acts 2 in his sermon. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and knowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Who is responsible for the death of Christ? The Jews, the Romans, the mob. In one sense, all of us who have sinned and benefited from the cross work of Christ and ultimately God the Father. Please, the Father to crush the Son. Let me give you another example of the enmity, the hostility of natural man against God. It is the world of man's religions. We recognize that the irreligious man, the immoral man, it's easy to paint that picture and say, yep, <laughs> he hates God. Look at him going every way the opposite direction. He, the only way he can talk about God is as a swear word. He just wants nothing to do with God. For him, it's all mockery, rebellion. He's going off and doing whatever he wants to do. But the religious man, outside of Christ, however clean and moral those religions may seem, however tireless that man's efforts, is still enmity with God. To, to worship a God of your own making or to try to worship the God of your Bible, but on your own terms, is to remake God. The rejection of God's righteousness and the attempt to establish your own is enmity towards God. To refuse the gospel and say, I, you know, I, I don't need the, the death of Christ in my place. I don't need to be born again. I, I got this, God. I, I can clean myself up. I, I can clean up my act. I can get things together. All I need is a little bit of Jesus added to the rest of my otherwise pretty good life. How can this be construed as anything but hatred for God and his ways? Listen, if you could have cleaned up your own life, God would not have crushed his beloved son. The death of Christ on the cross does not prove how valuable you were, how worth it it was for God to give some token acknowledgement of your inherent goodness and your hard efforts. But it is actually the unconscionable, unspeakably awful act of God to crush his innocent son in the place of sinners. And that's our only hope. To reject that in the place of my own religion is hatred for God, enmity with God. You're, you're opposed to everything that God offers freely in love to sinners who will believe. Man rejects God's standard and exchanges it for a cheap imitation that man imagines he can comply with. He still can't even comply with a cheap imitation. Ask any Roman Catholic or Mormon or Muslim. Hey, are you going to heaven? Well, I hope so. Have you done enough? Oh, I don't know. How can anyone know? I just hope God is merciful. What a tragedy. Dead in transgressions and sins and stiff-arming the only remedy. At the extension of the gospel, natural man rejects it. You see, the gospel offends natural man's sense of his own merit, his own righteousness. The gospel assaults his self-esteem, which actually must be crushed if he is to have eternal life. A natural man has a hard time letting go of his attainments. My own grandfather said it this way. You're telling me if a thief on a cross can go to heaven while I've worked my whole life to be a good man? I won't believe it. He stiff-armed the gospel. The natural man can't imagine that all of his good works must be repented of. Can't imagine that being a pretty good guy is worthy of hell. You see, the religions of man are flagrant hostility to God. They're unworthy of the esteem of men. It's strange to me that, that people in Western cultures 
We'll look at something like Tibetan Buddhism and say, oh, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that peaceful? Get close, and it is the ugliest thing you have ever seen. It's awful. Even an attraction to Jesus and the things of Jesus can be enmity towards God. Well, I've rejected all the world's religions. Jesus is the one that I want. It all depends on why you come to him. In John 6, Jesus had fed the masses. And the point of his miracle was not to fill every empty stomach for the rest of earthly existence. That was not the point. The point was a comparison to Moses in part, a contrast. What Moses offered the people in the wilderness as they walked around was bread that God provided. And now Jesus is the bread of life that God provides. Jesus is the one that men must consume and have if they are to have life. And Jesus feeds the people miraculously fish and bread out of nothing to demonstrate he's the creator who creates ex nihilo. Everything comes into existence by the word of his power out of nothing. He does that with fish and bread. And he feeds. In John 6, 26, Jesus says to them, you seek me not because you saw signs. In other words, not because you understood who I am, that I'm God in the flesh, and that you need me, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. They were following Jesus for a free lunch. In fact, they were so impressed by Jesus and the free lunch, they conspired together how they might take him away and make him king. And Jesus' response to their fleshly ambitions was to walk away and pray. After offending them, <laughs> eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, then you can be a part of me. They didn't understand. An attraction to Jesus can be a mask for hostility towards God. I want to read from Martin Luther as we close this morning, and I recognize we're halfway through. We'll finish this next week. This week is the 501st anniversary of the Reformation. That's a big number. I don't know why 500 is a big deal. 501 is a great big deal. So we can't let this week go without singing Luther's song or at least quoting from his conversion. So I forgot to ask Sam to sing Mighty Fortress. My fault. That one's on me. But I do want to read to you from Martin Luther's testimony of his own conversion because he describes in detail his own hostility toward God and what it looked like. He was hostile to the righteousness of God. He says, I had indeed been captivated with an extraordinary ardor for understanding Paul in the epistle to the Romans. The single word in chapter one, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed, stood in the way. The gospel is good news, but not for Luther. The gospel was not good news because the righteousness of God stood in the way. And if the gospel, according to Paul, is good news because it reveals the righteousness of God, Luther didn't get it. He says, I hated that word righteousness of God which according to the use and custom of all the teachers, I have been taught to understand philosophically regarding the formal or active righteousness, as they call it, with which God is righteous and he punishes the unrighteous sinner. Do you understand? How can the gospel be good news if the gospel reveals God's righteousness? I hate God's righteousness. Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfactions. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners and secretly, if not blasphemously, blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God and I said, as if indeed it is not enough that miserable sinners eternally lost through original sin are crushed by every kind of calamity by the law of the Decalogue without having God add pain to pain by the gospel and also by the gospel threatening us with his righteousness. 
Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. Nevertheless, I beat importunately upon Paul at that place, most ardently desiring to know what St. Paul wanted. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words, namely, in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, as it is written, he, through fo- he who through faith is righteous shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness with which merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. There a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself to me. Thereupon I ran through the scripture from memory. I also found in other terms an analogy as the work of God, that is what God does in us, the power of God, which makes us wise, the strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. And I extolled my sweetest word with a love as great as the hatred with which I had had before the hated word, righteousness of God. You see, the gospel gives a righteousness that the natural man can't love, can't aspire to, can't go get. But in the work of God by his Holy Spirit to regenerate He brings new life. And the credit of righteousness by faith and the beginnings of the work of transformation by the Holy Spirit in us. This life in the flesh is only overturned by the Holy Spirit. You might be here this morning and recognizing, maybe for the first time, that you are in flesh. That the flesh is all you've ever known. And maybe you are confessing for the first time that this has all been hostility toward God to this point. You need to know, friend, that Jesus Christ came to the earth to save sinners. And everyone here this morning who is in Christ can give testimony to the fact that God saves sinners, just like you. And we would love to talk to you. If you're troubled and conscious this morning, if you want someone to pray with, if you want to find out more about how you can be in Christ and under the reign of grace and under the rule and governance of the Holy Spirit and have new life and forgiveness of sin, would you talk to somebody today? One of the elders, uh, someone at the information table, or maybe someone that brought you here this morning. Let's pray. God, you are kind. You have, in fact, demonstrated your love towards sinners and that while we were your enemies, Christ died. Your love has been poured out within our hearts through your Holy Spirit who you gave us. While we were helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. One would hardly die for a righteous man Though perhaps for the good man, someone might dare to die. But you demonstrate your love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And much more than having now been justified by his blood, shall we be saved from your wrath through him? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to you through the death of your son, much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved in his life. Thank you.